Yeah. 
He held the stars in his infant hands. The heavens sang the night God became a man. Hello, North Point Church. This is Pastor Rob. Welcome, welcome to Christmas Eve, our online virtual worship service. If you're watching this, it probably means that you are unable to make it to Christmas Eve services this evening. And so we wanted to have an opportunity for you to join us in worship virtually in your living room. I've gathered here in mine. So gather your family, gather around, grab your Bible, and friends, let us join together as North Point Church, as brothers and sisters, as people on the journey, on the way to Bethlehem. Let us pray. God of grace, pour out your love into our hearts tonight as we remember the giving of your only begotten Son, how he was given, why he was given. Lord, bring your presence deep into our souls this evening that we may understand Jesus' birth like never before. May it touch our lives and affect how we live them. We gather now through the power of community, through the power of this technology, and we do it to your glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, let us hear the Christmas story read again to us as it comes to us in the Gospel according to Luke chapter 2. The scripture says, In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. So all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and the family of David. And he went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and whom was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, in that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. Friends, this is God's word. It's given to us tonight. Thanks be to God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord, our rock, our redeemer. I wanted to share with you an experience I had about 13 years ago. I was just finishing reading a bedtime story to one of my kids. It worked. They were asleep, but it worked too well, for I had kind of dozed off. And Barbara, my wife, came into the room and woke me and, and um, 
said, you know, time to, time to come to bed. And, and suddenly I, I could think, I had thoughts, but when I tried to speak them, they wouldn't come out right. My words were jumbled. Half of my body was a little tingly. Uh, getting up, I did was able to walk and, and make my way downstairs, but my eyesight wasn't right. It, it, there were things floating around. Now, now you, you would probably think at this point, yeah, I sh should have gone to the hospital, but I did what every good husband does at that moment. I just said, I think I'll go to bed. I'll be fine. <laughs> I wasn't fine. In the coming days and weeks, I had adult onset migraines that set in. And, and after a, a long story made short, my, my doctors, who were persistent, di discovered that I had something called PFO, Peyton Formon Oval, a hole in my heart, simply put. And I've he heard that from, from doctors that this is quite common, actually, more common than we would think. But, and most of the time, um, you, you don't notice this, uh, that you have a hole in your heart. You function really well. Um, the doctors, as they, I remember them explaining this to me, said it's an amazing uh, process of how the human body forms. Do you know that when you come out of the womb, uh, your, your breathing is taking place in a different way, right? We're getting nutrients and oxygen through the umbilical cord. But, but when we first come into the world, that's why that first breath is so important. I was told that um, that first breath, I don't know, maybe that's why they, they spank a child to make sure they, they a newborn, so to make sure they get a, a good dose of oxygen. Because um, what's happening is your heart is not fully formed right when you're born as it was described to me, but there's these two flaps of skin that have this sticky substance on them. Isn't this incredible? <laughs> we are so wonderfully made. And, and when that oxygen goes through our body, that first breath of life comes in, those two flaps of skin smack against one another and form the last chamber wall of your heart. And then you're fully formed, fully developed at that point. Well, if you have PFO, like I did, it means that those two flaps of skin didn't stick right, or, or maybe there was a wrinkle, and for some reason, there's a, there's a hole. Now, most of the time, again, as I said, people can get by with this, and, and I did for 30-some years and never had a problem until, and except, it's dangerous if a small, small clot some way, somehow finds its way through that hole, and then it goes straight to your brain from what I understand. And so I wasn't having migraines. I was having little TIAs, little mini strokes. Brain scans showed that I had some, some brain damage, which by the way, I know TIAs and strokes are very serious and I don't wanna minimize that, but on a comic level, I do use this sometimes with my wife. When I forget something at the grocery store, forget an anniversary, a birthday. I just simply say brain damage, brain damage, honey. Well, I want to talk today, the, tonight on this most holy of nights about a hole, a hole in our hearts, all of us, not, not, your literal metaphor, or your literal heart, but a metaphorical heart, your, your emotional and your spiritual life. See, biblically speaking, all of us, all of us have a hole in our hearts. All of us, as, as one theologian once said, and it's been attributed to many, there's a God-sized hole in all our hearts that God is simply waiting to fill. But beyond that, we also have in our lives, we develop holes in the heart in other ways emotional holes when people hurt us. We have um, maybe relational holes in our life where we feel empty. We feel like we're, we're not functioning as God taught us or made us to function. And so these holes persist. There's a writer by the name of John Eldridge. He writes about the masculine spiritual journey mainly, but he he, he comments that, that so many times if, in growing up and developing in our spiritual and our emotional lives, that if we don't get certain things met along the way, a void is created, a hole in our heart. That's our human condition. Sometimes unintentionally, 
it happens. He, he, he talks about his young boy. Uh, and if I remember the story right, he had two boys and he was rock climbing with them. And, and uh, they were both down at the bottom and the youngest son came up first. Let's say he was 10 or 11 years old, about that age. And he comes up the wall and, and John's at the top and he has him on his son on belay. And, and his son had to do a difficult move and uh, to, to get up this face. And, and he got up and he was so proud and he gets over the edge. And, and John said to his son, son, that was so awesome. You did a great job. Well done. And then his Son took off the gear and, and sat down behind him. He was huffing and puffing a little. And John then uh, went to give all of his attention down to his other son and throw the equipment down and the ropes down. And, and he heard his 10-year-old little boy, 11-year-old little boy behind him say, Dad, Dad, did you really think that was good? You see, all of us look at certain stages of our development for that validation that we have what it takes from an authority figure, from a parent, from, from a teacher, from God. And many of us are left with holes in our heart. And by the way, we try to fill these holes in our lives, don't we? Sometimes with distractions, sometimes by overwork. Sometimes we try to fill the holes of our heart with money. Anything that we can stuff in to those holes, power, anger, alcohol, drugs, Everything and anything has been tried, and nothing works. So all through this Advent season, we have been um, unpacking the Christmas story, this most audacious plan that God had to give his only begotten son to the world, the giving of the Messiah. And we've been looking at the characters, the people whom God chose, right, to, to carry out this audacious plan. Elizabeth and Zechariah, Mary and Joseph. God chose them intentionally. And hopefully you've learned something about God and who God chose and also about yourself and your journey with Jesus. So as we approach this Christmas Eve, I would like us to talk about the shepherds very quickly. We heard about them in the gospel according to Luke chapter two. The shepherds, I think, are the most misunderstood characters on the road to Bethlehem in our modern day society. These men, and, and I'm going to say women too, who watched over their flocks by night. You see, they, they, we have a very romantic version of the shepherds, don't we? They were outdoors people, strong and rugged. They maybe had time to reflect and journal and read, we think. What a great job. We have a romantic view of sitting out and watching the stars, protectors and guardians. And it's true. Biblically, we have, you know, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. King David was a shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. But, but here's the thing. At the time when Jesus was born, the reputation of shepherds had lost its luster, at least for the religious folk of the day. Historical research on shepherds shows that they were seen as, as being vagabonds at best, thieves at worst. They were dirty, <laughs> grimy, spent a lot of time outdoors. Because they were outdoors, they couldn't come to church, go to the temple, the Jewish synagogue. So they weren't trusted. Do you know that in the time of Jesus, we have evidence that, that uh, in the Sanhedrin, in the Jewish courts, a shepherd's testimony was not accepted as reliable. They were so looked down upon. They were seen as less than. Now, that should interest us. That should interest us because there's a part of us that can relate with the shepherds. Less than whole sounds a lot like that hole in our hearts, isn't it? A part of our life that feels not godly. Maybe we have guilt or shame for it something that doesn't feel right, that's maybe unacceptable. A place where we've been hurt or scarred or wounded. There's a shepherd inside of each of us. This probably explains, this does explain, why God chose the shepherds. Have you ever wondered? Why did God cho choose shepherds of all people to have the angels come and deliver and herald the good news of Christ's birth? I believe it's because 
The shepherds were the ones who needed to hear this good news most. I believe the shepherds would have embraced this good news. The shepherds would have been the ones who, who knew what it meant to need a Messiah. So how do we fix holes in hearts? Let me share the story of how they literally fixed the hole in my heart. And uh, it's, it's kind of a funny story. They told me before the surgery that I could stay awake if I wanted to. They'd give me a little anesthesia. But really what they do is they run a, a, a tube through your leg and up into your heart. And since there's no pain, neurons, or receptacles in, in your heart, I know I didn't use the right word there, uh, you know, they could do that and you could stay awake as long as they kind of numb the side in your leg. And, and, and they said that we could give you a, a little bit of medicine, a little bit of anesthesia to make you feel comfortable, but you could stay awake. Or we can give you enough anesthesia to make you feel like you've had 10 cases of beer, he said. So... I decided to stay awake and watch this procedure. So what they do is they run this tube up into your heart and through the tube, they run a patch. And it's an interesting thing. I'm actually going to show it at church, a video of this happening inside my heart. Don't worry, it's black and white. It looks like an x-ray. And, um, and what they do is they put this patch through the tube and it's a, it has these little metallic arms and they look like a spider and it has this mesh on the outside of it. And they pop the little patch through on one side of the hole in the heart after they measure it, which is very important, how big the hole is. They grab the right size patch, they run it through, and they open this little arm. It's like an umbrella against one side of the hole in the heart, against the wall. And then they pull that patch through and pop open the other side. And like an umbrella, the arms collapse upon themselves and are pushing on the wall, and they're filling the hole. And the mesh is there, and, and over time, and it doesn't take much time, literally our, our bodies grow skin and fill that hole. That's how they fix it. So here's what happened to me. The doctor had explained to me. He said, now, the most dangerous part of this procedure, the most dangerous part is making sure we have the patch in place, but they have hold of it at that point. And they said, what we do is we unscrew that patch through the, the catheter. We unscrew it and, and it'll pop off. And then it's set. I remember him telling me this. He said, this is the most critical part because if we didn't get it in there right, it could pop loose. And you'll be conscious for three to five seconds. And then you'll be out. <laughs> That's it. My doctor, I wouldn't say, had the best bedside manner. So... He gets to this point. I remember I was awake. I'm watching all this. And I was pretty calm. I mean, I was nervous watching it but, and a little scared. But, but honestly, I, I thought it was fascinating. And they get to the point right where they're about to unscrew the patch. Remember, he said this is the most critical part of the procedure. And what happened at that point is he said to his nurse, the head nurse, he said, hey, you, you've never done one of these before, have you? And the head nurse said, no, I have not. Right away, I was uncomfortable. What do you mean the head nurse had never done one of these before? That was problematic enough. But what the surgeon said next was even more problematic. He said, so, would you like to be the one who unscrews the patch? Remember, he just told me. He just had said, this is the most critical part of the surgery. And he was going to entrust it? to someone who'd never done it before? I literally raised my arm on the table and said, do I get a vote? <laughs> and he said, absolutely not. And if you say another word, I'll give you those 10 cases of beer. <laughs> so be quiet. Well, I'm sitting here. It was successful. But uh, this, the nurse, as far as I know, did undo that patch. Friends, tonight, on this most holy of nights, on this Christmas Eve. You need to know that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to heal our whole ridden hearts, to meet us at the point of our failures, at the point of our sins, at the point of shame, at the point of our woundedness, that part of us that feels unloved. He inserts himself 
his only begotten son. He becomes flesh and patches our heart. And in doing so, he promises to bring us healing and, and give us value and assure us that we are loved, forgiven, that we do have what it takes and we are whole, W-H-O-L-E. I think this is precisely why God chose shepherds to be the ones who first heard from the heralds, from the angels, that, is, that a savior had been born to them, who was Christ the Lord. Because they were the people in society with the biggest holes in their hearts. And God chose them on purpose. He chose them so that you and I can walk from this church tonight, metaphorically. We're going to walk from the church on Christmas Eve but that you can leave your living room tonight knowing that God's patched your heart, that God wants to heal your wounds, that God says, I love you, and I want you to function as you were created to function. Isn't it time that you do it? Now, if you study the life of Jesus, what's very fascinating, when he grows to 30, begins his public ministry, and for three years, what you will begin to notice is Jesus, time and time again, will go to the people in society who, who had gaping holes in their lives. Go ahead, read one of the Gospels in the coming days. I encourage you to. And you will find that Jesus goes to people who had parts of themselves that didn't feel worthy or loved. They were like the shepherds. And time and time again, Jesus came with the message. He's the patch. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the patch. And he put, God put him with surgical precision in our hearts. God did not trust that mission to anyone else. God was that surgeon who put Jesus precisely in the whole of your heart. And all we have to do, all we have to do to feel that wholeness and that healing begin is to do what I did on the table. I didn't have much of a choice. I had to trust. Just say, okay, I can't do it. I can't fix myself. I'm just gonna trust. So this brings us back to you on Christmas Eve. We're the shepherds in God's story. People whom he's seeking to make whole again, W-H-O-L-E. And all we need to do to make that happen is say, God, I trust you. The shepherds left the story amazed and rejoicing and went back to their fields, knowing what God had done for them. And so may you leave this evening in our evening service in the same way, amazed at God's love for you, singing and rejoicing that your heart can be healed, that you can begin that healing process tonight. For in the city of David, I bring you good news of great joy. In the city of David, a savior has been born to heal your heart and make you whole. And that is Christ the Lord. Would you pray with me? God, who so loves us, you know our hearts. You know everyone listening to this message, and, and you know why they're listening. You've choreographed this message to, be, to land on iPhones and computers and TVs, and everyone who listens to it is like a shepherd, like I am as well. A hole in our hearts that just waits to be filled by you. Lord, forgive us for trying to stuff other things in that hole to fill it, and all our attempts to do so have been fruitless. But Lord, tonight we are told the reality, the good news, that you come, that you heal, that you fill that hole. And so I pray for everyone listening to this message, and if they begin a new spiritual journey, Lord Jesus, may they know they have a church to come to, to grow, to challenge, to serve, to walk with them on the journey that is following you. We pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. North Point Church and all who are hearing this message, Merry Christmas. God bless you.